I'm going to turn it back over to you, Berger, for our first session. Uh, and it's focusing on what is going on right now in the Nordic region during this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. So please, Berger, take it away. Thank you, Robert. And uh, as we discussed, a key, a key mission for the Nordic Innovation Summit is to ask the question, what can we learn and what can we teach? And uh, with that in mind, we've uh, brought together some of the world's leading practitioners and thinkers when it comes to this unique situation that we're all faced with right now. Uh, so without further ado, if we can bring up the panel, uh, we will hear from um, Dr. Cora Mulbach, who's the exec Executive Vice President of Staten Serum Institute. We'll hear from um, economist and crisis specialist, Sven Harald Øygaard, who also was at some point uh, a governor of the Central Bank of Iceland. And finally, of, we hear from Alma Muller, who's the Director of Health at the Directorate of Health in Iceland. So we'll start out uh, with Cora, uh, who will tell us a little bit about, just in terms of the bare facts, what is the situation right now across the Nordic countries as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you for the kind introduction. I have some slides that uh, I would like to share with you. So could I have the first slide, please? Thank you. So uh, the situation in Shets in a snapshot is that we had the first cases uh, seen from January 26 to February 28. So the first to detect the case was Norway and the last was, was, was Iceland. The situation stayed pretty calm with single cases until we started to import cases from, from Italy and Austria, maybe skiing tourists returning at the end of February and the start of March. And from the early March, uh, community transmission was recognized in, uh, in all of our countries. And we went almost at the same time from uh, from a containment strategy to a, to a mitigation strategy. And we took slightly different routes uh, from that point in time. Uh, but, uh, but the commonality was that it was all very proactive. So, so we started to act before uh, we really had a major uh, challenge for our healthcare system. So in Iceland and uh, and in Norway, it was mainly a suppression uh, of the of the outbreak, uh, and uh, whereas in other countries it was more mitigation in order to uh, to sustain a healthcare service throughout the uh, out outbreak. Um, in in Sweden, they, there was a certain focus on developing herd immunity that was not the case in other countries, um, and the lockdowns that we introduced. Uh, were based on a combination of legal and uh, voluntary measures. In Sweden, it was uh, mainly uh, through voluntary measures, but in all countries, it was a combination of those measures. So, so there are some difference about schools, restaurants, shopping malls, and uh, and the size of mass gathering that was allowed. And we do not have the time to go into details with those. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the numbers. So the key figures is that uh, uh, that now uh, the the epidemic has peaked uh, in in all countries uh, and uh, in many countries it happened uh, already uh, around uh, the first of uh, April. So that's a few weeks after the lockdown was uh, uh, started, uh, and the reproductive number is now low uh, below one which means that on average we have less than one secondary case from a primary case. The recent estimate is around 0 0.5 in Norway, 0 0.7 in Denmark, and between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 in, uh, in, in Sweden. You note that the incidence was highest in, in Iceland, and that's not because they had the highest number of cases, but because they had an impressive testing activity from the uh, Start and and the uh, and, and the and the incidence measured in cases per hundred thousand was lowest in in Finland, but but these numbers do reflect the differences in testing activity rather than the the real incidence. Also note that there's a a, a very great difference in the number of reported deaths. 
So the the uh, mortality was lowest in Iceland and and seems to be highest in uh, Sweden uh, until now with 317 death per million inhabitants uh, and my own country Denmark at uh, at 95 uh, 91 uh, as the second one. Uh, next slide, please. So if we want to compare countries, we really need to compare apples with apples and not apples with oranges. Uh, and we have a way to doing that, and that's the Euromom project, uh, which is a project that monitor excess mortality. So, so these uh, time series shows uh, the number of uh, the difference between the number of, of observed death and the expected death. And uh, unfortunately, Iceland is not part of that uh, time series. Uh, but what we see here again is that Sweden stands out uh, with uh, with a high degree of uh, excess mortality. And these are expressed as standard deviation uh, scores, set scores. So these are not actual numbers, but shows how much it's, it's uh, deviates from the average. Next slide, please. So, so, so how can we uh, summarize these uh, results? So we can see that all countries have passed the peak of the epidemic. Uh, the second wave is highly uh, probable in epidemiological terms because uh, most of our population remains in, immune. Uh, but I think it's unlikely that it will happen in real because we know what can be done. We know how to make a, a, a lockdown. We know how to do contact tracing and we have ramped out test capacity uh, due to uh, innovation. So, for example, in uh, in nine days in Denmark, we built a brand new laboratory that can handle 10,000 PCR uh, samples per day. Uh, we have seen no breakdown of the healthcare system, but we see that the different policies lead to different numbers. And in particular, uh, Sweden stands out as having a, a higher burden uh, of uh, of disease uh, mortality in uh, home and home care. Uh, for home elderly uh, nursing homes. Uh, but I think it's too early to judge who took the right choice uh, because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. So so whether Sweden will stand out at the end of uh, 2020 is uh, impossible to say uh, because we don't know what will happen during the autumn. So thank you for your, atten for your attention. been going on, how people actually have behaved in the face of uh, different types of instructions and, and rules uh, from central government. And we've invited Sven Harald Øygaard, who yeah. is uh, an economist, a, a crisis specialist, and uh, is also uh, actually releasing his uh, book in the combat zone of finance in the U.S. Uh, next week. And uh, if you look at the website for the event, as well as in the chat box on YouTube, you will find the the website for that book, where you can also find his blog with some of this material. But Sven Harald, um, what can we say about how people have reacted um, to this unique situation across the Nordic countries? Yeah, thank you, uh, Vigge. And I will build on uh, Kåre's points on the on the different routes of the Nordic countries. Uh, so first, allow me on, on slide one. Uh, basically, it shows the trajectory of the disease in the different Nordic countries. So if you go to the next page, please. Uh, so basically, uh, channel, was there a problem with that? Yeah, well, this is the, the three routes. That's the right one. So, okay. So uh, this basically shows very simplified the trajectory of the disease in the in the different countries in the Nordics, plus the US and the UK for reference. And as mentioned uh, by Kore, Iceland is a very special case, and I think I recommend everyone to look at it. And it, we will also will talk to it later, because it's basically the country in the world that has tested the most which means that the numbers from Iceland, in that sense, should be the most representative of all. Uh, of course, they show uh, this immense need for uh, hospital places, 6.5% of those infected, and for intensive care, 1.7% of those infected. It shows a mortality rate uh, for all of uh, 0.1 uh, for the ones below 60, and 3% above uh, for the ones above 60 of, of years, years of age. So it basically gives their representation. Of course, it also shows that the disease can be taken out uh, very simplistically. If you all go 
to the store, uh, stock up, and then go home and lock the doors for 14 days. Uh, the disease will be gone globally after 14 days. That, of course, is not uh, going to happen, uh, which takes us to the different uh, other scenarios. We have Norway uh, that have, uh, together with Denmark, basically marginalized the disease. Uh, then you have uh, Finland and Sweden that have sort of flattened the curve, uh, as mentioned. And uh, especially Sweden has been sort of, uh, of course, that many times mentioned as a special case, because I guess they are one of the few that have kind of declared more or less explicit this objective of flattening the curve and of herd immunity. They basically say that the strategies of Norway, Denmark, and Iceland aren't, aren't robust. They cannot last for long because the world will again open up. And then we have, as you know, the two to the right. These are the, 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 the trajectory of the diseases. On the next page, I go to the trajectory of the policy response. It's a bit uh, complex chart. Uh, it's made by Oxford University. On the x-axis, it basically shows the timeline, and the y-axis shows the harshness of the policy response, basically of the lockdown by country. The, the one in blue on, is Italy uh, on the top, and, and Sweden uh, is at the bottom. I think many Swedes will say, well, that's a, um, basically the legislation and the, the firmness of the guidelines isn't that harsh in Sweden, but all the Swedes are expected to do the right thing. So it basically, yeah, as you will see in the next slides, it's not fully representative of the actions in Sweden. The next slides basically shows the population response. And it's a, again, it's a very interesting tool uh, provided by our dear big brother, uh, Mr. Google, basically shows the change in the, in the movement pattern by country. On the left, uh, basically, uh, the, the workspace activity. So what amount of time and activity people spend at work. Uh, the number two is the kind of, um, retail and recreation, then is grocery and pharma, then is transit stations, and then on the right you should say residential. So when people aren't at work, they're, they are more likely to be at home. And it shows that, uh, of course, South Korea is the kind of success case with uh, track and trace uh, that basically allows them to handle the disease without shows close shutting down society. Then you have Sweden, uh, uh, sort of with a modest lockdown, uh, and the three uh, other Nordic countries here are kind of in the mid-tier. Actually, all with a uh, kind of looser policy as compared to the US, Italy, and especially now UK. Um, as a paradox, the harsher measures, uh, the more mortality. Uh, and of course, that's because um, the kind of root cause analysis goes the other way. <laughs> the, the, the more mortality, the harsh, harsher measures. So of course, the, what you can learn from the Nordics, and I think both Denmark and Sweden, um, Denmark and Norway and Italy in Iceland are now providing exi interesting examples because this tightening for a period allows now a reopening of society that will be economic activity back where it was. But the impact is, is disastrous. As we go to the next page, uh, which basically shows the unemployment level uh, by country. I mesh, it's difficult to compare um, numbers across countries because, uh, yeah. So actually here I did a bit different than what's normally. I looked at the unemployment compared to the total population. And of course, the Norwegian numbers are most dramatic. Uh, they just uh, sort of go sky high immediately after the uh, government lockdown on, on March. Well, it's good news and bad news. I think one of the Thank reasons you. why they are so high is because the government support schemes are very generous. Uh, they're basically 100% compensation for everyone who loses their job. Um, while uh, in, um, in, in Sweden and Iceland, they have spent more focus on ensuring that people stay at their workplaces and they compensate the employee, the em employers uh, to keep people at work. The U.S. numbers are also put in, uh, shows the kind of, again, the tra tragic trajectory of, of the U.S. While actually a bit surprising, uh, all the numbers from Sweden, Germany, and Denmark are at a completely different level. The Iceland numbers uh, are also showing a very rapid increase, but again, because of the policy response of of compensating employees for keeping people at work, uh, they aren't that dramatic. The last page is on yeah, what are the, uh, the direction of the policy uh, response for the different countries. Uh, I try to see if there's something kind of brilliant that has been done, uh, especially with regard to innovation. Uh, I think that hasn't really happened so far. Um, it's something that's now being discussed on, on how can we get out from the crisis modus into a kind of a re rejuvenation um, recovery modus. 
with more focus on the kind of long-term measures. But what has happened so far, of course, a ramp up of capacities in the free for all uh, Nordic healthcare systems, which of course has been an important part of why all the countries have been able to manage this in a good way. Uh, in Denmark, Sweden, uh, they have put in place schemes to cover the fixed cost of, cost of, uh, of the companies. And as I mentioned, co-financing by the government, uh, yeah, also of the, la- of the, um, of lowered rates to the landlord. So if the landlord lowered the rates, the go- government basically compensates part of that. Uh, you have governments comp- that compensates part of, uh, the, the cost of part-time employment, uh, expanded, you know, unemployment benefit, uh, deferred tax payments, loan packages, uh, especially when you get sort of private sector co-finance. So basically, so far, uh, the focus has been on compensating whoever loses their job, uh, compensating employers to the extent possible. And then as, as uh, time passes back, uh, by, uh, we will see more systematic measures to recreate growth and, and um, support innovation in the Nordic area. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Harald. Uh, suspect there will be food here for thought among academics, social scientists, economists, and others uh, for years, maybe decades to come. But uh, you did say that you were looking for something brilliant that's been done, and uh, that was what we did too. So um, we invited um, Alma Muller, who's the director of health, that's the director of health in Iceland, to give us a more kind of A to Z uh, story about what Iceland has done, because their numbers are are truly exceptional. So Alma, please. Yeah, hi everyone, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, can I get my first slide, please? In the meantime, I would like to help uh, thank Mr. Nordic for mentioning Björn Ibsen and Engström, since I am an intensiveist uh, myself. Uh, I don't see my slides, but you do. Yes, it's all good. Okay, but I would like to see them too. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see if th- there is actually a Zoom window that has them, but you may have to flip through them to, to see if you could uh, locate it. Okay, okay. Um, I think a key to the Icelandic uh, response is that we already had a uh, a pandemic national response plan in place. And we also have uh, very clear acts uh, to follow. And I want to add that we also had very good actors that you see and that have cooperated very well. Uh, Next, please. And this is the status now. We have only 12 active cases. We have no uh, patient in hospital and only two cases for the last 11 days. Uh, Next, please. And as already mentioned, we have tested a lot and more than any other country I know of. uh, And we have also been uh, fortunate not to have uh, very many deaths, 10 deaths and and low death rates uh, per 100 cases, as you can see. Next, please. Uh, Our strategy was to ensure that uh, our infrastructure, especially healthcare, would withstand. And we did that by flattening the curve, by uh, protecting the elderly, by having sufficient PPE and other equipment. And I must uh, say that we never ran out of anything. And we also managed to uh, do a build a reserve squad of healthcare workers. So we used both uh, containment and mitigation. Next, please. And uh, we decided very early on that informing the public was of utmost importance. And we started to give uh, daily press meetings uh, some days before the first case. And I must say that this has been more popular than any soap opera ever seen in Iceland. And we also uh, did this new homepage, COVID.ice, that you can look into. It's in eight languages. And we have published several guidelines. Next, please. And we aimed at early detection. So we had already been tested, testing for uh, about four weeks when we had the first case. 
And we also uh, got into cooperation with Decode Genetics. It's a private company for extensive screening of the population. And of course, uh, we put all the infected in isolation. Next, please. So we did extensive uh, contact tracing with a team of nurses and police officers. And we also uh, launched an app very early on. And uh, that has led to that 57% of all cases diagnosed were or already in quarantine. Next, please. And these are our social measures. They have not been as extensive as in, in many other countries. Uh, we were very early to put restrictions regarding uh, visiting of, of nursing homes. Uh, we have kept the kindergartens and grammar schools open for the whole time, but with some restriction. And we closed, but we closed high schools and universities. And we had ban of gatherings of 100 and then of 20. Uh, next, please. And regarding healthcare, we have done uh, well, I think. We used mathematical modeling to predict number of cases, need for hospitalization, and need for intensive care treatment. And that was very helpful. And then we did something that I find brilliant. We put together an outpatient clinic that monitored every single infected person in the country. And we did that by telehealth, first by risk assessment, and then with an urgent care center so we could intervene early uh, if the patient was deteriorating. And in uh, my opinion, it's no doubt that this has led to fewer hospital admittances and, and less need for intensive care. And our ICU mortality is low, 10%, and mortality in ventilated patient is 16%. And the next, please. So this is our model, just to show you an example. The solid line is the likeliest prediction. The dotted is the pessimistic, and the red is exponential growth. And the dots are what actually happened. So it has been very exact. Okay, let me notice next. before we end up. And uh, you mentioned that... Uh, there wasn't reported any exit, uh, excess deaths. And that's true for Iceland. It, indeed, it is even somewhat lower. So we feel confident that we, we did uh, necessary health care and we didn't uh, miss any uh, COVID cases in the community. And next, please. So I think we have been successful up till now. And uh, these are my thoughts that we are small enough to have short chains of command and be able to act with speed. And it's also has been possible to have oversight and control for the whole time. But we are also uh, large enough uh, to provide uh, good health care. And next, please. So these are our next uh, projects. That's, of course, to continue COVID vigilance and care. We have started to measure antibodies. We are trying to get health care uh, back to normal. We are doing research on the effects on public health. And we have already uh, started our exit strategy. And we are going to open our borders uh, and, with, and test there on June 15. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alma. Uh, it's, it's truly a, a fantastic story. And uh, at this stage, uh, we have time for one question that we've taken on YouTube from the audience. And I think it's one that's, that's relevant across the Nordic countries, but uh, I'm going to ask it of you, Alma. Uh, is there any evidence that the opening of schools and daycare centers is fueling an increase of new wave of infections in parents and teachers, if not in the children themselves? No, we see so very few infections in children. And the research that Decode Genetics has done shows that it's very unlikely that uh, uh, adults, in, that kids infect adults. Indeed, it's the other way around. And we haven't closed school, but we have now uh, no restrictions. 
So it's too early to tell. We, we reopened everything on 4th of May. So um, we should get the answer in some days, maybe. But we don't think it will cause another wave. Thank you. Very short comments, Sven Eisenhower. Thank you, I had a question for Alma because I think it's a very interesting case because uh, Iceland has really, as you said, shown how it can be done and it's taken out the virus. At the same time, Iceland is a tourism dependent economy. So basically, as you said, you have to open your border. So what you do, in that sense, it's a very good illustration of this kind of wave two, what to do the day after. So uh, what's the strategy and, and what's the probability that you actually can keep Iceland in the situation where you are now? given the need to open the economy, given your dependency on tourism. And what can the learn, world learn from that on the trade-offs that we need to face as we go further with the pandemic? It's a super important question, Alma, but uh, I'm going to have to ask you to be, be short in answering it. Okay, so uh, on the 15th of June, we are going to have some different uh, choices for our tourists. They can choose to go to quarantine for two weeks, they can come with a, with a certificate that they have a recent PCR done in their home country or that they have antibodies. And we are also going to uh, screen at the border. So we are going to test this for some weeks and then reevaluate. Thank you. And thank you, Kåre. Thank you, Sven Harald. And thanks again, Alma, for volunteering to enlighten us on such short notice. Uh, and please uh, stay with us as we'll revisit this uh, uh, topic several times during the day, not least in our final panel, where we'll be joined by uh, four uh, prominent health tech leaders.